Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On this week's episode, we have Coach Kelly Wells, former coach from the University of Pikeville, who's going to join us and tell us everything about NAIA. Are there scholarships? How many schools are there? What are the pros and cons of it? We've talked in the past about D1, D2, D3, JUCO, and now this kind of uh, finishes up our series on letting you know about all these different levels and kind of the ins and outs. So Kelly will share that with us. Kelly is a three-time All-Stater from Rowan County, Kentucky. Uh, he went to three Sweet 16s when he was a player and then played D1 at Tulsa for one year. After their coach left, he transferred to Moorhead State, where he played three years. And from there, he coached in high school, where he won a state title at Mason County High School in Kentucky. And on that team was Mr. Basketball Darius Miller, who also played for UK and John Calipari and won a national title with them, and also played in the NBA with the Pelicans. He also had Chris Lofton played for him, which is uh, one of the best shooters in SEC history. Uh, from there, he coached at Hawaii Pacific, so we get to hear about that. And then from there, he came back to the University of Pikeville in Kentucky and had two NAI Players of the Year play for him, as well as winning the 2011 National NAI Championship. He was taking D1 transfers back in the day before the transfer portal got so popular. So such a great conversation with a guy that's won at a lot of levels, uh, who's played at D1, who's recruited D1 players, who's dealt with transfers, and just a great conversation with Coach Kelly Wells. So without further ado, enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Kelly, welcome to the show today. Hey, Corey. Thanks for having me. We're. Uh, I'm excited to catch up with you. Yeah. So for those that don't know, Kelly and I go back 30 years, and he doesn't even quite know this either. But I'm going to give you a quick rundown of our history. Uh, when Kelly was a senior in high school, he was such a good player in the state of Kentucky that he was uh, asked to be on an AAU all-star team that played against a Russian team. And I was a ball boy for that event and gave Kelly a high five there. And then I was also a ball boy at the OVC tournament when you were playing for Moorhead State. And I guarantee you, we probably did a high five there as well. And then back in 2010, my first player ever that I placed into a prep school before all this turned into the prep athletics uh, machine it is today was a young man by the name of Toby Earhart and Kelly worked Toby out after his post-grad year and offered him a full ride to his college, Pikeville, University of Pikeville. And uh, Toby played uh, for you for a little bit. So we have touched kind of over the course of three decades. And I just wanted to remind you that uh, it's good to talk to you again. <laughs> yeah. Does that, does that just confirm that we're getting old? Is that what you're trying to confirm? A little bit, and um, we'll get into this too, but Kelly uh, won a national title at the University of Pikeville back in 2011, and to congratulate you, I actually sent you that program of you in it with, I think some NBA players are in that program, and you sent me back a, a t-shirt, a national championship t-shirt, and I, I, I keep probably 12 t-shirts in my repertoire, and yours I am wearing today. For those that can't see this on YouTube, I have used this as a muscle shirt uh, for the past 11 years and that it's made it this long is amazing so every time i put this on the run or lift weak you know light weights you're in my head kelly so good to see you again <laughs> i love it I, I hope it charges you up and motivates you that's awesome. oh absolutely so one reason i wanted to have you on the podcast is that we have done overviews of playing college at the d3 level the d2 level the junior college level and I want to give people out there that don't know much about the NAI level kind of a perspective on what that is as an option. Because as you run into all the time, Kelly, about 90% of the kids I talk to are D1 or bust. And especially in this new environment where it's so much harder to get a scholarship at a high school or prep school, I want to present this option to them as something to think about. And there's no one I thought would be better uh, to talk to than you about this. So to get started with this whole conversation, tell me a little bit about just a broad overview of what NAI basketball is. Well, you know, a lot of times parents and players kind of put things in a, a stair step, so to speak. So you've got junior college, division three, NAI, division two, division one. And, you know, I, I don't know that that's a fair assessment, especially in the current 
state that we're in. Uh, I think finding the right fit for you in terms of what program looks like and school looks like is probably a better way to evaluate it. And, you know, we get recruiting services like everybody else in the world. And, you know, it, they, they do. It's this, this kid's a high D1. This is a mid D1. It's a low D1. Never mentions that the possibility of, of being an NAI player is on that list. So I think sometimes there's a misconception of how good it is. Thankfully, in the state of Kentucky, at least, uh, people have a really good understanding of what the NAI is because we're so heavy and strong here with the Georgetowns and the Cumberlands and Lindsey Wilsons of the world who all play in that division and Thomas Moore. So uh, I think that does help us perception wise and understanding in our state. But really, when you get out of that, it's, it's a tough challenge. You'll get into some states that don't have uh, NAI schools whatsoever. Um, you know, trying to compare that to Division Two is is not always easy to do. Uh, obviously, we're not high major institutions. However, uh, it seems here the trend is to uh, some of these Division One schools to cabbage some of these grad transfers that are seniors in college. I know two of the national championship kids that played at Loyola Chicago uh, are now going mid major Division One. So, uh, Tevin Allison just went to Youngstown State. Uh, from Cumberland's Kentucky as a grad transfer. So really the talent nationwide has really started to level out just because of information. Uh, but I, I, you know, I think there's a misconception of how good the NEI is and the quality of education. Like we have two medical schools on campus as well as our uh, athletic department. And if that doesn't offer some credibility on both sides of the table, you know, I don't know how else you do that. Yeah. Tell me this uh, for a history lesson here. How did Kentucky NAI schools get so good? I, I, Kentucky basketball is pretty good. So I think there's a correlation between the two of those. Uh, and I, you know, not to, not to toot the horn of all of our schools in our, our area, but a lot of them focus on basketball and they have great coaches. Uh, Happy Osborne's of the world, the Donnie Butchers of the world, you know, all of those folks have done great uh, things in our profession. And, uh, you know, you got guys leading like Scotty Davenport who just moved Bellarmine to Division One, And, you know, there's a lot of great coaches at our level. Uh, and I think a lot of that correlates into success and, you know, we try to do things the right way. While basketball is important, we try not to be defined by scoreboards. We try to be defined by making uh, students turn into the best versions of themselves. Yeah, and one thing, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but, you know, there's an, an MO on Kentucky kids that if they go away to play D1, they're going to get homesick from mom and dad and their girlfriend, and they're going to come back. And that's where they end up at places like Pikeville, Georgetown, Lindsey Wilson. Is that kind of how it got started, do you think, as being a safe, good, competitive place to come back to if D1 wasn't all these recruits thought it would be? Yeah, well, I'm probably a poor one to ask that as I went away to Tulsa and then came back to Moorhead and finished my time up. So I'm one of the living examples of what you're referring to. But, you know, one of our, our biggest recruiting pitches when we talk to high school players is you're always welcome back here. Mm -hmm. That's part of our final closure. So they may be going to wherever, Timbuktu, and – uh, they always know that they're welcome to come back when, when or if those things don't fit them correctly. And, you know, a lot of our schools have made their, their living on, on return kids. And but we've, you know, we've had a lot of kids from Kentucky go out and do well, uh, but the majority have, have normally found a way to come back home to do well. Yes. All right. Number one question a lot of people are going to have, does, Divis does NAIA, do they offer scholarships, full rides? Right. Yeah. And, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, does it does it look a little different than most? Yes, it does. So like we take in consideration, that, you know, division one school will say you're either on a full scholarship or you're not. Uh, we're not like that. So we can give partials. We can give three quarters. We stack academic money, your federal financial aid money. And really every institution has their own way of evaluating what a scholarship is like. So while we're allowed to have eight full scholarships, uh, that dollar amount looks different at every institution at, at our level. So it's similar to D3 then where you pack it, you have eight scholarships, the dollar amount to work with, but you're almost like a, a baseball GM trying to give a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe a good player's coming in, want to give more to him. You're balancing like that then, correct? Sure. And instead of just having 13 full scholarships to say, here's what you get athletic aid, we kind of move it around a little bit where we have, uh, we call them fully covered scholarships. So it may be covered by because you're a 4.0 student plus your academic incentives plus your uh, athletic money makes you a fully covered student athlete. You have no bills. That takes care of room board, tuition, books, and fees. It just looks a little bit different in terms of how it's written up. Is that just for you, your school, Pikeville, having any scholarships, or is that across the board, across the country? Yeah, that, that's the limit. Now, when we did, when we put in uh, NAI Division One and Division Two together, uh, the common ground was that we didn't want to have so many haves and have nots 
eight was the number the NAI settled on. So at one time we had 11, uh, and then to, to put ourselves competitively with the Division II NAI schools, that was the number we fell on. All right, tell me the difference between NAI Division One and Division Two. None now. We're all in the same boat. So there used to be difference in scholarships and commitment made. Uh, that has all changed. So now the NAI just has one division, uh, and we're all working in the same boat. That's why we switched the national tournament to 64 teams instead of 32 because of the addition of that, that entire side of NAI. How many NAI colleges are there that offer a basketball program? Oh, man. I think it's just shy of 300 right now. Wow. That's a, lo that's, that's a lot of roster spots available to kids out there. It, it really is. And again, of course, like anything, there are the haves and have nots. That doesn't mean every school mm -hmm. has a. You know, some schools operate with less uh, and choose to do that. Uh, but majority, I know all of them in our league all offer eight full scholarships and then, um, you know, go from there with other competitors. Now, in recent years, the transfer portal, especially post-COVID, has taken off. And now D1 coaches are really spending a lot of resources looking into that. And some coaches are now only looking at the transfer portal. And you and the other Kentucky NAI schools have been taking D1 transfers for years. But you've also taken kids straight out of high school. So when you're coaching – you know, what was your mindset on, okay, this year we want to get, what was your mindset on how many high school kids you wanted versus how many transfers you wanted? Yeah, I think, I think balance is the key word for us. Uh, you don't want your transfers to eat up your new students coming in as well. So I think balance is important for us. We were probably 70, 30. So we, we wanted most of our kids to be uh, either high school or prep school type kids coming in with the longevity to, to sustain uh, and 30% being transfers. Now, there were years we did it just the other way of that. I mean, it fell in our lap that there were enough kids that we liked that we'd take 70% transfers. Uh, but the, the thing we've always tried to keep in mind is there is always a reason a kid is transferring to school. Do those reasons fit in our culture? Do they not? Some could be just you're not playing enough. So it could be you had a death in the family, you want to get closer to this region. So like understanding of the reasons why kids are in those transfer portals is important. If they're, uh, you know, things that, that we don't accept in our culture, those are kids you have to be careful of not letting them in sneak into your program. So while we don't have all the resources in the world to do all that research, you got to really be, be careful of taking advice from coaches, people you care about, mentors, people that are around those kids, academic advisors, uh, to know exactly what you're bringing into your program. So since you've been doing this for many, many years before, you know, the transfer portal got so popular, what if, if a coach, if a D1 program asked you to be a consultant and say, hey, how do we play this market? What do we look for? What would be some tips you would give them? Well, thankfully, we have, we have been considered one of those destination schools of transfer. So we, we get calls all the time that maybe we didn't even reach out. So we were kind of a transfer portal before there was even one available. So are uh, you looking for a six four guard who can really score it that maybe is playing behind an all American in their conference and not going to get any, any burn. Would you be interested? So, you know, I, I think that the biggest thing is to understand what's important to you as a player. Like if your happiness is only going to be surrounded by playing time at an institution, that that's a risky move, you know, like, cause there's going to be times you're not going to get to play. You might even get hurt. Uh, you might get red shirted, things of those nature. So being able to have connecting points, otherwise, like, do they have a, a program there? Like, for us, a med school is somebody want to be in biology, want to try to get to, op, you know, optometry school from there. They want to get into a med school program. Those kind of connections fit really good is entertainment, the being able to go out in clubs and to go find those kind of things is important to you. You're not going to find that at, at Pikeville. But like it, you have to understand what's going to make you happy. And if those are the things to key to your happiness, you got to measure if that's the right kind of fit. So that's the questions we ask. Are they, is this kid that has to go out and party and, and do all those kind of things or the things he's really interested in, a really good academic school, a place that plays really, really good basketball, and one that really values the uh, the product that they put out in, in being quality people. We have those things. Now, if there are other things, we can't change where we are or who we are, but you gotta you got to measure those. That's an advantage you guys had, Kelly, of being a, a school that people knew to reach out to if they wanted to transfer is you kind of sit back and just, you know, do the due diligence in the kids you liked. Nowadays, with these coaches actually looking at the portal, you know, they can, if they want a big man, they can see all 50 big men in the portal and the bandwidth it much must, must take to answer all these questions you just mentioned would take someone 24 hours a day, because not only are you looking at these, these kids, so are potentially 20 other schools, right. Who might be reaching out to them first. So to me, I, it's just a pure wild West. And I can't imagine a D one coaching staff now and just the bandwidth it must take to sift through all of this, if that's the route they're going to go. 
Yeah, it, it's challenging. And I think the world of college basketball really shrinks in the coaching market because we all know each other. We all talk. We all have those connectors that we use. Like I'll, I'll have 10 people that I know I like to call and I trust their opinion. And there's 200 of them. I, I, I wouldn't trust their opinion no matter what they told me. I'd have to go do my due diligence and my research. So I try to stick in my circle. Mm-hmm. Those guys know all the other ones, too. So those 10 guys that are at the NCAA level recruited all those other kids as well at some point. They'll say, listen, that kid will not fit good with you. I know your personality. I know what you like. I know who's successful there. But now this these two kids you need to call about. So that, that kind of shrinks that world a little bit for you. Um, you know, I'm not the most trusting person, but I have people that I – would take their word and, and I'd ride with it. So understanding that it does shrink a little bit with, with your connections. And that's the thing that uh, I try to tell kids is it's a lot of it's who, you know, I mean, there's great talent out there. It slips through the cracks, but like you would never have, you know, gotten Toby Earhart on your team. Had I not given you that call and we not known each other, you know, 15 years prior, and you're going to pick up the phone too. when I call you in the future about a kid, cause you know, I'm not going to waste your time. And it's just, that's how it works across the basketball world. So it really helps to have an advocate that's trusted, has a good track record, um, that when they call folks like you, it, you're not having to go through that whole introduction process that that foundation's already been set. Yeah, it, it, it's critical not to burn bridges. So that's, that's yeah. for kids, coaches, uh, and it's okay to have your feelings hurt and it's okay to uh, be sad, but like don't, don't burn bridges because coaches talk, administrators talk, friends talk. Other players talk. Some of our best recruiting is done by a player that we may have gotten and said, listen, I've got two buddies that are here and there that are just like me, personality wise, just different positions. Don't burn bridges. That's 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 great advice. All right, you mentioned all the pros of, of doing NAI. What are some of the cons of playing in an NAI program? Well, I, I, I think the, some of the things that we have found that have been deemed as negatives is you don't always play in the best venues all the time. So there's there's facilities that aren't the greatest. Uh, we don't fly very often to, to games. We normally charter those at our place, which is, which is great, but there's sometimes we take vans. Uh, budget wise are probably a little bit different in terms of overall budget nowadays though, with Under Armour contracts and Nike contracts and Adidas contracts, even at our level, the, the amount of stuff that kids get is off the chart. So we try to treat it as nice as we possibly can, but I think the, the facility issue and, and like we're not we're not going to Rupp Arena very often you know we don't play home and home with Louisville uh, so trying to to find a different level of happiness if you're worried about having you know 16,000 fans at your games that, that's not a reality now do we have players that go pro absolutely quite a few of them uh, but I think D2 had the best messages all of our students athletes will go pro in something but it might be law school it might yeah. be med school so like the focus may shift a little bit uh, I have always found that it's a good, healthy balance that we have with the, the mission of character-driven initiatives plus being able to be a player and a student. Uh, I've always enjoyed that that aspect of it where it's not cutthroat and uh, everything's about business decisions. Yeah, perfect. We're going to go back in a time machine now and start talking about uh, you before you got to Pikeville. And for three years in high school, when you played, um, you ended up at Sweet 16 at Rep Arena in Kentucky and Freedom Hall back then when they alternated. Um, and you're six, seven, a uh, good player. How did you get good? What, what was your motivation and how did you get to, to become a D one player eventually? Well, my, my dad was a college basketball coach. Uh, now he, he coached women. He started the, the women's program at Moorhead state. And I tell people all the time, like I, I learned to play with, with the girls. Uh, my dad would bring me to practice and no matter how small I was, I was in the drills, passing, catching. I was the ball boy at, every event that ever came around. I was at every basketball camp that was offered. Uh, and I think I just got, I fell in love with it, you know, and I think when you fall in love with, with a sport, you're just genuinely going to work at it. And I think that really became my passion while I did other things and I played other sports. Uh, there was no doubt my passion was to play basketball. And I just threw myself into it and being raised on a college campus, I had the ability to play with older kids all the time and grownups all the time. The gyms were always open. I wasn't stuck playing by myself all the time. And uh, while there is value in that, I, I had a good balance to be able to do both. Yeah, and that's huge. Playing against older, better competition. That's something that just you can get better exponentially doing that. And I don't know how many kids do that nowadays, but you eventually settled and committed and played a year at Tulsa. Who are the other colleges that were recruiting you where you eventually chose Tulsa over those schools? And why did you choose Tulsa? Like, talk, talk to me about your recruiting in high school. 
Yeah, I had a ton of the OVC. Majority of the OVC was involved in, in my recruiting. Obviously, hometown, Moorhead was a big part of that. Uh, Creighton University in Nebraska was one that was really heavy in that recruitment. And really, when it came down to my decision, it was Creighton and Tulsa, who were both in the Missouri Valley uh, at the time. And, you know, I tell people all the time is to try to find a fit. Uh, I knew that they did not have a, a, a shooter. They didn't have a wing who really understood perimeter play. Uh, that was where my focus was. I wasn't the greatest defender in the world. Uh, and Tulsa played a, a defense called the ball line defense, which required trapping the post, closing out, uh, not necessarily as much one-on-one -on -one defending, which was, was appropriate for me. Uh, I ended up starting a lot of the, the time I was there. We went to the NIT and I started in those games. Uh, so I think fit was the biggest thing for me. And uh, to be able to play for a coach of J.D. Barnett, who was at VCU and uh, just had really, really great knowledge of the game, was important at that time to me. And it was the right fit for me. And then when he got fired and uh, he had to leave, that's when I had to make a decision. I, you know, in hindsight, they hired Tubby Smith. Uh, <laughs> amazing, amazing things there. But at the time, that didn't connect with me. They were pressing. They were running and jumping. And that was not who I was. So I came back and played for a guy named Dick Fick, who was actually – the assistant coach at Creighton who was recruiting me there. So it just was a pretty seamless uh, move for me to come home. For those that don't know Dick Fick, uh, tell people that don't know about Dick Fick, what made him so special. Cause I remember when I used to go to those games, um, I just would watch him because he was yeah. a madman. Yeah. He, he was entertainment plus no question about it. He, uh, at one time, uh, he was he, on ESPN. They had the Dick Fick award for any craziest acts that happened that week. Uh, of the season anywhere in college basketball. And uh, he was most famous for his act at Kentucky where he fell down uh, on his back and held his tie up like he died on the, on the court. And uh, as a player, we didn't always love that. That was kind of, I think it took focus off what we were trying to do, uh, but he brought more entertainment and value to Moorhead than had been there in a long time. And, you know, we were the focus every week on ESPN, our university uh, for his award. So it did give some value there. And um, I, I'll never forget, all the fun we had. Uh, he was a great offensive basketball coach, uh, had some issues, but uh, certainly uh, was a good experience for me. And, that, you know, I met my wife while I was in school there. My parents were still there. So there was nothing but good for me out of that. Yeah, and Mark Campbell was one of your teammates, right? Mark was, for sure. Yes, so I was, a, I was a freshman, Henry Clay, and they made my, me. I was 6'3", like 140. I'd have to guard him every day in practice. And I'm just like, I'm not getting better. Mark's not getting better. Uh, he's just creaming me every day. I, we were um, he was on my downside of leaving. He was younger than I was. I hate to admit that, but he was much younger than I, but I did enjoy getting to know him. Yeah, and you had Brett Roberts, too. I don't know if you were there for him, but he was a leading scorer in the country at one point. That, that was my transfer year. That's why he got so good offensively. I guarded him every day so he could score. <laughs> so just so you, people know, I was the um, – I held the microphone for ESPN at the championship game for the OVC tournament in Rupp Arena. And the reason was my father and a couple other partners brought the OVC tournament to Rupp Arena – Thought they'd make money. They didn't. But that championship game had Brett Roberts, who was a leading scorer in the country, against Popeye Jones, who was the leading rebounder in the country. And uh, just that doesn't happen every day in a conference tournament final. So I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, Ro I think it was R Roaring in Rupp Arena, I think was the motto during those times. And those were great. Those were great times. And we just we never could get over the Murray State hurdle down there with, with okay. Brown that bunch as well as Popeye Jones they were so good and those were some of our better teams we just could never get over the hump with them so when you going back to when you decided that Tubby Smith's coming in it's not the style you wanted to play did you kind of was Moorhead always your fallback school since you grew up there or did you look at other schools and talk to them when you put your name in the transfer portal back then well I, I think once I knew coach Fick, that was coach Fick's first year he just had gotten the job uh we had that connection there and I it, I didn't I didn't look anywhere else I knew okay. that that was and that was my second choice for college when I was going through the first time, just so happened to land in my hometown. And, um, you know, when you, when I, I, I was probably the biggest indicator of those Kentucky kids going away, ready to come back home. And I had some of that in my, in my mind as well. Yeah. And you can speak to kids now too, uh, or at least you did in your coaching about that same scenario, right? Hey, I went away from home. It wasn't the best fit. I came back. It was successful. So you, you knew exactly what those kids were thinking about that left Kentucky. Yeah, no, no question. And it, it is hard. I mean, I, I get it. You want to, you want to venture yourself out there, but, and I was pretty well-traveled. I did a lot of AU stuff back in those days. We went everywhere with 84 teams. Yeah. 
that I hadn't been exposed to in camps and staying with other people. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I've always been a family guy and being around my folks was, was pretty important to me. Now, after your college career, you started coaching high school basketball, and that culminated with the state title in Kentucky uh, when you were coaching at Mason County. We're going to get into the Mason County specifics, but I asked Danny Haney a few podcasts ago uh, what makes Kentucky basketball so special, and I'd love to hear you know, what your thoughts are, not Kentucky basketball in general, but Kentucky high school basketball. Like, What makes it so special versus other states? <sighs> You know, maybe our tradition and community, maybe those two things put together. I think the tradition and uh, love for the sport. I mean, we've got here in, 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 in our area in East Kentucky, we've got a Mountain Sports Hall of Fame. And, you know, the, 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 the images of King Kelly Coleman and those folks it just resonates around here. So, like, I think the traditions and uh, every generation of person you talk to has a story of some sort about basketball in, in high school. Uh, whether it was a cracker box gyms, whether it was the scoring, uh, whether it was the environments they played in. And there's there's no there's nothing more special than taking a community, taking an example like Mason County and Maysville and everybody buying into what you're doing and, and, and just connecting that community together. Those are relationships you keep for a lifetime. Uh, and I think that's different. I mean, the Breckenridge counties of the world who, you know, swing in and, and played a one three one defense and won a state championship. That community is always going to be connected connected through that and uh, it's no different for a lot of these places that have one state champion and and I yeah. hope our I really hope that our state continues to keep that tradition alive we've we've implemented the, the all a and some are starting this 2a and I don't I don't really want to get into a 2a 3a 4a and all of that I think that would diminish what we're trying to do but I think the all a classic settles the small school debate uh, and keeping one state champion alive really separates us from everybody else yeah, and for those that don't know, uh, Kentucky, you can have um, – any size team can play in the state, state tournament. In fact, a few years ago, um, it was um, a team from the mountains. I think Shelby Valley versus Ballard. Is that right? Like 2010. And it was, just, it was Hoosiers in, in real life in Kentucky in modern times. And um, that can still happen there. So a small mountain school can win a title, and you're not split up into classes, and it's not diluted. So that's what Kelly's talking about, and it's so great. And this all takes place at Rupp Arena. Which is a which is a cultural event every year in the state of Kentucky. So, when you were at Mason County, um, that team has had a lot of success. What, why does Maysville year after year have such a good team? What is it about that community? Well, I think I can only speak from from my time and the previous time and what we used to do. And you know, we started those kids super young. So, like we had AU programs, summer camps, uh, leagues. Uh, and they were all ran by our school system. So like we tried to get as deep into that as we possibly could and really get them to fall in love with just playing basketball and organized basketball coached up in a good system that necessarily wasn't just parent driven, uh, but actually had coaches who were coaching our system while we did at the high school. And I, I'll have to give Danny, as you mentioned him, Haney, a lot of credit. The, the system he put in in Lexington Catholic was a whole lot what we modeled. So our, our elementary school, we're doing the two, two, one press, our middle schools, our junior high came to high school and we were doing the same thing. So our kids knew that system. They played on the AU circuits and, and we didn't go out at that time and play AU for, you know, grassroots, different teams. It was our team. We took our team out to play in those AU events and it really made us better. And I think we established a culture of, playing all of our sports internally at our school. Uh, I encouraged our kids to play football, baseball, whatever they wanted to do. We didn't try to keep them in one sport and having great coaches in other sports helped that as well. And, and winning is contagious. Uh, I don't care what anybody says. If you learn to lose, you know, that's contagious too. So we wanted our kids to be around winning, winning people and winning programs. And I think that was our difference at Mesa County. And I think they've carried that tradition on really well. Yeah. And you actually on your championship team, you had Darius Miller. And Darius Miller became Mr. Basketball in the state of Kentucky. He won a title with Kentucky and then eventually a title. I mean, a title with the University of Kentucky and Coach Calipari. And then eventually played in the NBA. Everyone wants to play in the NBA that, that reaches out to me and mostly reaches out to you as well. But less than 5,000 people have ever played one minute in the NBA since its inception. So with that being said, with, with Derek being um, – or Darius being so – you know, hitting lightning twice, what did he possess that got him to that level that maybe other kids didn't have? 
Well, one, he had a dad who could really teach him how to play. And Darius's dad, Brian, was a great player at Morehead State as well. So he had a model right there in his house to teach him work ethic, to teach him how to how to play. And his mom's a super lady who's also very tall. So, like, he had some genetics that, that mm-hmm. weren't bad. Uh, but, like, his level of work uh, was, was amazing. And he learned a lot of that from Chris Lofton. Chris was that guy, too. Chris would – uh, during football season, would still get up in the mornings, make 500 jump shots before he got to school and play a football game on Friday night. So, like, that work ethic is just a separator for, for people's talent. Now, you know, Chris, as good as he was, as hard as he worked, he never played a play to play in the NBA. Now, did he go and play overseas and play and had a great career? He sure has. So, like, it's not guaranteed for anybody. But I think Darius is height. Uh, on top of his work ethic and like he just he could do it all like there wasn't a part of the game that he missed he could guard he could defend he was a three level scorer could shoot to three get in the mid-range and also get to the rim and uh, by the time he got to the professionals with the pelicans like he was he was a sniper like he was a professional shooter didn't miss and uh, he gave made made himself valuable and had to fight through some tough times at kentucky Uh, but he did that and, and made himself into a wonderful man and a wonderful player yeah, and you guys beat Lexington Catholic that year in the Sweet 16 to get to the finals, right? We, we did. We, we, had a, we had the hardest trip through there with Louisville Trinity in that mix. We beat Ballard in the finals. Wow. Uh, by, like, we really had it going. If uh, I'm not 100% sure if the Lakers didn't show up, we couldn't have won. Maybe we just – we had that mojo going, and that shot was falling. So, I was I, – it was fun for a coach to sit back and just see the fruits of your labor and, and come true while you're watching it. This is an unfair question to ask, so i um, just going to say that from the get-go. But what was sweeter, winning a high school Kentucky State title or winning a national NAI title? Or are they yeah, different? That, that's unfair. It's like asking you which child you like better, one of those kind of deals. It's unfair. But, I admit it. Yeah, I, I will say this, though, to be transparent. Like, when you have a – like, our community was super involved with our championship here at, at Pikeville, but it's different when you're when you're at the high school level. Like, yeah. that's – every person in your community is connected to that where at the college level, not everybody's as connected. So uh, I think that connectivity and all of that in that community made it super special. And and, uh, we loved our, our time doing it here at at Pipeville and tried to do it as many times as we could. We just did it once, but uh, certainly the, I'd say the Macy County one affected a lot more people. Makes sense. Now, after your high school career, you took a a couple time zone trip out West to coach at Hawaii Pacific. Correct. Tell me about that. That sounds like for a Kentucky mountain boy going to the island, sounds like a big jump. It, it was a big jump. It was strange. Um, <laughs> to, to give a little bit of history lesson, that's right after we won state championship. We're runner up the following year. Uh, I was just did Kentucky, Indiana all star games. We just won national coach of the year. It was really a pivotal point in my year, in my life. We just had my uh, first kidney transplant. So I had some health issues that were coming my way. And I, I knew if I wanted to be a college basketball coach, the window was now. Uh, Just so happened my coach that we talked about at Tulsa was J.D. Barnett. He was the athletic director at Hawaii Pacific at the time. uh, And that's kind of made that connection. We knew we had to either either make the move or not make the move. And we decided it was time to do that. Uh, And I, you know, I, I called Coach Patino, actually, who was the only person I knew that had any history in Hawaii whatsoever. And I asked him, I said, well, what do you think? Is this a stupid move? Is this just, what do you, what do you say? And he said, well, the good thing about coaching in Hawaii, if, if you do good or do bad, nobody's going to know anything about it or remember anything about it. And, and certainly that has come true. Nobody remembers right. when we were about 10 and 10 and 19. I can't even remember what it was. So uh, that was a great experience for me to learn the college game and recruiting uh, really outside of anybody knowing what we were doing. What level is Hawaii Pacific? They're Division Two, but they switched from NAI to Division Two uh, two years before I got there. So, how do you recruit? What's your pitch? Well, obviously, you get everybody in the country to visit. That, mm-hmm. That's the but you really have to be careful in trying to to figure out what that looks like. And uh, for me, it was to try to fit our system. So, uh, you know, bringing a Kentucky kid to Hawaii wasn't always the easiest kind of thing to do. We spent a lot of time working in California, Arizona. Uh, the West Coast is is really our biggest area to do that, which is all new to me. That was mm-hmm. a whole new group of people that later on connected some of my better players that I had here at Pikeville because we made connections while we were out west uh, in Honolulu. Is that where the, it's located? Is Honolulu? Yeah, right, right downtown. Yeah, you had to figure out like who's just coming out there to get a vacation, who really wants to be there. It, it's got to be tricky, and and what you had to fly everywhere, correct? That is, yeah. The, the, the good part during the holiday seasons, we could get anybody to come play us. So we sure. were 
loaded up our schedule during Thanksgiving, during Christmas, during New Year's. That's the time we really brought people out for tournaments and tried to get as many games as we could. Thankfully, there were several schools on the island that we got to play. But, like, we'd fly to, to Washington and we'd play a four-game series while we are gone. So we'd play four games in six days so it didn't have to miss as much school as we, we possibly could avoid. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it was a travel – travel heavy type scenario but you know we when we bring kids on we, we kind of had a soft commitment from them before we would we would bring them to campus unless it was just a somebody we were really really trying to wrench to get in there they they, they had to provide us pretty good uh evidence that if they liked it this was going to happen and why'd you decide to leave well it just it wasn't home okay. uh, I, you know, to get back to see anybody was you know almost <laughs> like living overseas like you, right. you have to my home, you don't just get there. And uh, it just, it wasn't a, a basketball state, no question about it. You know, we didn't have our own gym. We used one uh, that was, was ran by the city there. Uh, the dorms and everything were downtown. It just was a different type of scenario for me, uh, understanding basketball. So while it was a great experience, I'm, I don't regret one second of it. Uh, the right thing for me was to get back to where I gave myself to be, a, gave myself an opportunity to be a head coach at college level. Yeah, and you mentioned your your kidney transplant. What, what did you learn from that whole situation? Well, I, I, I not only learned it once, I've learned it twice. So we've, we, we've had two now. So, like, uh, you know, for me, the, the word grit comes to mind in terms of that. It really, you know, I was I was raised the right way. My parents did, did the right things by me to, to make sure I was ready for adversity. And you really don't know what you can accomplish till you have to. Uh, so, like, I was in that scenario that I had to, to figure things out. And, you know, we all – have choices in life and whether we want to be positive about it or negative, I chose to be positive and to persevere. And I wanted my life to have more meaning than just being a coach. And I wanted to set an example that like, this can be a life changing experience for you. And I was blessed that uh, my wife was my first donor. Uh, and 10 years later, my brother-in-law was my second donor. So I've really, I've really been blessed in my life to continue on. And I'm as healthy as I've been in a long time. So I'm thankful for, for all those who've had an opportunity to help there. Oh, that's great to hear. I'm glad that worked out that way. Um, so after Hawaii Pacific, you come back to Pikeville, back in Eastern Kentucky, and within five years, you win a national title. And also during that time, you've got two NAIA National Players of the Year. You know, there are 300-some schools out there, like you mentioned, that's, that are never going to sniff a national title. So what did you do, or what did the school have in place already to help you win a title within five years? Well, I, I think support would be the first word I, I would use. Uh, in, when I was hired, they kind of gave me the keys to the car and said, listen, we trust you to, to make the right decisions. We're here to support you. Uh, don't embarrass us. Don't do those kind of things. And we always made sure we did the right things. And those, those first four years were tough. Uh, and to tell you that those were peaches and cream, it was not. We had to take chances on some kids that I didn't feel comfortable taking chances on. But to get that startup going, we had to do some of that. Uh, but we finally figured out with, with a roster, we came in as unranked team in the national uh, tournament and, and won it, you know, the lowest seeded team in it. But I've always been the guy who's bet on myself and bet on my teams and bet on what we've done. And uh, we just went out there and let our hair down and really just played as hard as we could and, and found success. And that bred into the, the ultimate success of seeing the right kids in the program, winning, graduating, putting it all together. But uh, to be honest, those first few years were not easy. They were as, tough in my coaching careers I've ever had yeah well that's good to hear uh we do a segment on the show and mostly I talk to prep school coaches Kelly um but you know we always talk about kind of famous alumni of the school that uh, I'm talking to so I'm going to run three names by you here and you're not graded but these are three famous alumni of the uh University of Pikeville I'm going to let, let me know if you know them or not and tell me a little bit about them okay okay I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send this uh, portion to your school president if you get one wrong. Okay. All right. Great. Donnie Jones. Yes, DJ. Yeah, <laughs> D, he's a great alum. And uh, DJ and I talk monthly. Uh, he's done a great job at Stetson. He's been a great mentor to me, but also a great advocate for our, our program in school. And every year that I coached at Piper, we went to Orlando, and he always let us – practice at UCF. He always let us in to uh, talk to our kids. And he's just been a great uh, model for us to say like, Hey, listen, like we've got alums everywhere. And he's been very supportive. Him and his family have been um, just great mentors for me personally. Yeah. Okay. We one for one, John All Paul right. Riddle. All right. John Paul Riddle. You've got me on this one. I'm, I'm going to have to be at 50%. Yep. You're going to like this one. He uh, is the co-founder of Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. 
very nice. I did not know that. You have informed me today. Uh, Wikipedia informed me earlier uh, in my Cracker Jack uh, re- re- research team here at Prep Athletics. So thank them. Uh, that is great. I'll have to write that one down. Okay. And uh, Walt Harris. Walt Harris. I don't know Walt Harris either. Okay. Walt played basketball there for a blip. All right. I don't know when, what years, obviously not yours, but he's now the number 14th ranked heavyweight in the world for the UFC. Yes, I take that back. I do know Walter. Yeah, I, I didn't know him as Walt. Yep. He uh, just recently got defeated in, in the UFC and he was here for literally a semester. He played for Randy McCoy and I do know who you're talking about. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, one question I have to ask everybody because it's, you know, 98% of the kids that reach out to me, Kelly are guards, right? And 98% of those 98% want to play D1, right? So you've played that level. You've obviously coached players uh, at the D1 level and from the D1 level. What do you say that a guard needs to play at the D1 level? Well, the size is obviously critical. Uh, we all know that size, strength, speed are the things that you see on the peripheral. Uh, but, but understanding how to play. You know, there, anybody can go out there and play one-on-one. And uh, really, the game's turned into a lot of that. But understanding play, and obviously, you say guard, that, that's a vast range from point guard to the wing, so on, so to speak. So there's different skill sets uh, that you look for. But I tell our guards, you, you can still be you can still be small, but you can't be soft. I think it's a very very important that a level of toughness presents your guard play. And uh, the the biggest transition for kids from a high school level, prep school level, moving into college is their ability to defend their position. Mm. Uh, if I can score, or if I can get to the rim, or if I get more shots, I'll be really impactful in my play. Where in reality, coaches want to see the ones who can defend their position uh, that get out there on the court a lot quicker than those ones that just naturally have scoring. And it, it every kid falls into this fight or flee moment that they have as freshmen or prep school kids coming in. And whether you decide to fight or you decide to flee is critical. And, and a lot of people obviously are deciding to flee. That's why the transfer portal is what it is. But if you're one of those folks that's going to fight, you're going to find yourself opportunities to play and compete and win. Yeah. And you mentioned prep school players. You know, obviously we have Toby from our past. Is prep school somewhere you'd recruit? When you're oh, coaching, I, I, and we love it. Virginia Union or Virginia, we have three prep schools there. We love all those kids there. The military style of prep school, I'm a big fan of. I think there's a lot of lessons to be taught and learned there. Those kids come in and really don't just blend in your culture, but really mold your culture and really get yourself in a position of understanding of responsibility understanding of commitments and just probably are a little bit more mature, just to be frank. So anytime you can add those elements to what you have in your program, uh, whether they play a minute, those, those kids are going to impact your program in a good way. Yeah. And the, the prep schools Kelly's talking about are Hargrave military, uh, Fork Union and Massanut. And those are the three military schools in Virginia that yeah, absolutely do wonders. Uh, couldn't have said it better. Uh, now we're going to finish up here, Kelly, with kind of our rapid fire questions and, um, you know, then we'll get you out of here back to your, your AD job and everything. But uh, what's the biggest win of your career? I know we kind of touched on that earlier, but what are your thoughts? Well, I, I would have to say in, in my biggest win has my, been my wife. She's been the biggest win I've <laughs> here. Uh, she's just been, and my two children uh, make everything else possible. So, like, without those folks, it wouldn't be anything. So, but on the athletic side of it, I guess uh, uh, my biggest win would be our state championship and our national championship. I think those have been – just life-changing type experiences, not just game-changing. And while I didn't make a basket in any of those, uh, it's changed my whole life in a, in a good way. As a player, who's the best player you ever went against? Uh, we mentioned Popeye Jones was is, was definitely mm-hmm. one of those. He was absolutely uh, uh, amazing uh, in his play. Um, you know, I, I can remember – Oklahoma, Oklahoma Sooners, uh, when Billy was there, I'm trying to – Webster. Billy Webster was one of the best players I had ever seen. He was a 6'9 wing. Uh, and, of course, I got the opportunity to guard him. And I had no answers for him at all. And uh, when I was at Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, State had the Reeves, uh, Bryant, big Bryant Reeves, and he was just a mammoth of a human being. So those were probably the, uh, the ones I remember the most. And as a coach, who was the player that just gave the best performance you ever coached against? Against, uh, it, it always seemed like when we played Georgetown, they always had somebody that always always played super well. You know, I can think back to um, 
several years that they've always had 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 a great player, could have been player of the years. Uh, Chris Briggs has done an amazing job there, and before him was happy. They always had the best. They always brought the best out in you because they were always so good. So I, I don't know if I would pinpoint one of them, but it was always a Georgetown player that usually gave us the biggest fits. Gotcha. What's the best movie you've ever seen? Oh, that's you know I could, I could do the old standard Hoosiers, which is a by the way a fantastic uh, um, a movie. Uh, I'm a I'm more of a documentary type guy, and I'm actually looking forward to some of the new documentaries that are coming out with Netflix, so on and so forth. So, you know I I do like a lot of movies. It's hard to pick one of them. Um, I guess I have to bail out and go with Hoosiers then, so I don't make anybody mad. Not not a bad choice at all. I finally showed that to my wife like last year. She's like, this is amazing. I go, yeah, I haven't, I've, yeah, we've been, us basketball people have known that for 35 years. It's, it's great. Yeah. So if you ever get a chance to go, they, they actually have that gym open now. It's super cool. And a lot of high school people go in there to actually play games. Yeah. If, for people that don't know, you can just walk in there and they've got balls just sitting down and you can take shots with no admission. No, no. And you can go down to the locker room where Norman Dale gave a speech that, Kelly, you're so right. That's one of the coolest things to do in Indiana. And um, it's weird because you think it's out in the middle of nowhere in Hickory and it's in like a little suburban old school neighborhood. So yeah, they, they can manipulate those movies where they want them. Mm -hmm. All right. Lastly, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? My, my biggest hobby is golf. I really enjoy playing golf. It kind of gives me an opportunity to be competitive. My wife and I play uh, together. So it gives us time to, to spend together. Uh, but golf is my favorite thing. My dad and I used to do it when he was alive, and that was our that was kind of our thing. And I've tried to just carry that on. We we really enjoy that. Well, perfect. Well, thanks for sharing that today. And Kelly, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your story, being a D1 player, a transfer, a high school champion uh, as a coach, an NAI national champion head coach, um, dealing with what you dealt with with your kidneys and all that, and sharing, you know, kind of NAI 101 for families out there that might not know much about you know, this level of basketball. And I think it's very important now, especially today with everyone trying to get to that next level to know about this option. So thank you very much for sharing that information today. Yeah. Well, Corey, thanks for having me for, for no other reason, just to reconnect with you. Thank you for, for reaching out. And there's anything I can ever do, please feel free to, to let me know that, but thanks again for having me and, and hopefully added some value to what you're doing. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in today to the prep athletics podcast with our guest, coach Kelly Wells of the university of Pikeville. If you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and all the major podcasting platforms. This is Corey Heights. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.